Hey, hey, everybody. Sorry about the rug pull. Um, don't know what happened there. If you'd like to come up and ask a question and put the request up now, um, we're going to queue you all up. So put your question up now. For some reason, my other link, just uh, Twitter Spaces was glitching and it was just saying, uh, you can't come up, you can't do nothing. Um, all right. Okay. So uh, just a quick recap of the um, the events of this week. In case you didn't watch a YouTube video, make sure you go back to that. Um, I shared uh, some of the updates around um, a new agreement that we've that I've signed with Kirkland Ellis to be engaged as a plan um, con consultant in order to get more transparency in the Nova Wolf negotiations. Um, I also shared the three different types of strategies. We've got maximizing the Nova Wolf plan. And I talked about the different types of parameters in a stalking horse bid that any of the companies that has the relevant licenses that want to be involved in the plan um, can submit to the UCC. And I also shared about the concept of thinking about what a nicely managed and organized liquidation would look like in case we end up with some of the issues that Voyager are experiencing with the SEC, DOJ, um, and other parties. Um, so please do go back. Uh, there was lots of updates in there. Um, and there's an incredible amount of stuff that's happening uh, this week on all fronts in macro, in the Celsius case, in the Voyager case, um, and everything as well. Right. Okay. Uh, let's take some of the first questions. So Azad, uh, do you want to bring up some of the first couple of speakers? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you well, Azad. All right. I'll also, in case you need to shoot off at some point, I'll make Mary co-host in case we get an issue. Sure thing. Right, let's bring up Lawrence as the first speaker. Lawrence, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hey, Lawrence. Wonderful to hear you speak today. It sounds like you believe you have a good angle, some traction with the attorneys in this debtor and creditor and UCC. Um, I was very um, disturbed by the conversation I overheard, as well as I'm sure many of the people who believe in you and follow you. It was totally unacceptable and uh, the world's round. Um, I just wanted to say to you, the, my understanding is once the judge makes a determination to go forward with whatever plan it is, it's uncontestable. And if you feel that you're not, something's not right all the way to that point, I hope that there is a legal opportunity, a legal option for all of us coming together under your efforts and, and, stopping them in their tracks before the judge does make that final decision. So I wish all of us good luck and you good luck in, in helping to move this for the best of all the creditors. Yeah. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Um, my commitment to creditors remains as it was from day one. Uh, the very first day I said depositors first, if I had understood the lingo, it would have been creditors first. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of different processes that will fall out in court. Um, but my goal is more to just bring transparency to this process, reassure um, creditors that there is some kind of feedback mechanism and oversight so that if we think that this is going in the wrong direction, um, then everybody is sufficiently warned so that they can prepare um, and there's some accountability into this process. It's a it's, you know, it's, it's, it's something that has never, from my understanding of Chapter 11, um, it's never been done in this way with so many different creditors, um, with so many different um, classes and, and all sorts of stuff, um, with so much transparency. Um, and, and my real goal is just to bring a layer of transparency to this process um, so that we can just stop those surprises and then spirals and everyone you know, going nuts in a certain direction based upon misinformation. Um, and so I, I want to try and apply that type of pressure and that type of transparency. Thank you, Lawrence. Okay, next speaker is Daylong. 
Hey, Simon, haven't talked to you in a while. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for everybody, even the people who are listening, like uh, Alan and CR, who disagree with me a lot. Um, I just, I, I please tell me if I'm wrong. Disagree with me. I know I never always want the straight shot for you. You always always given it. Could you ex- please explain to the uh, you know the participants here that in the long run, on a dollar basis and on a time basis. People do, and I, I have no ill will towards anybody who's disagreed with me. And I want to hear what you f- truly believe that retail clawbacks do, and correct me if I'm wrong, do not materially help everybody else. And in fact, a lot like communism, that looks like a fantastic plan on paper between the time, the massive amount of time, and the massive money spent, and the opportunity cost of not keeping. Uh, retail uh, creditors who are subject to clawbacks that it's a net net loss for everybody and if I'm wrong let me know but as far as I can tell of all the research but I'm not objective because I've been subject I'm potentially subject to them could you explain that to them uh, well personally I believe uh, it's a it's a net negative it's bad for the industry it's bad for the company um, in, and it's just bad for everything all around we could have cascading liquidations we could have distress from those that, you know, took the right action and got out. Um, and, uh, you know, but I also believe that there's nuances in the subject and there's very, very difficult to get those um, taken away right now because the judge has set the process. Uh, the UCC has set the desire to put those in the litigation trust. And unless we get a competitive process, then I think it's more about defining what those clawbacks will look like and then the defences um, that will be coming through to try and do everything within the power of the legal system to make sure that they don't happen. Um, or if they do happen, that they're defined to the people that they were originally meant to. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Daylon. I understand um, your exposure. I personally don't have exposure. Uh, but I have exposure through my belief in over a decade of investing in this industry and what I think is right for the industry and the sector. Um, and uh, I don't think that devastating people in such times is the right way to go about that. But what I can promise you is that uh, within what I'm able to say, I will try and feedback and make sure that everyone has a platform um, so that people can really experience one of the things I liked about the latest CoffeeZilla video on um, Celsius and Alex Mashinsky was people just sharing their real stories. And I think I think real stories are important. I think, Daylon, you've always shared the impact that this has on your children and your family. Um, and so, you know, the more people can understand these things, I think the more likely we uh, can hope that at least the people that do care uh, will understand that. We've lost you, Daylon. You're a robot. <laughs> yeah, why don't you come back um, later? I think you've got bad connection. Yeah. Okay, let's yeah. bring someone else up, uh, Azad. Okay, let's bring up uh, hi, Velko Prime Render. Yeah, hi. I see myself here, so I'll uh, thank you for giving me the chance to speak, and uh, thank you to Simon, Mary, and everybody else on on their fantastic work. I just wanted to. Uh, it's not more. A, uh, it's it's not really a question. It's just uh, uh, from being on all these spaces and all the places. I see that there is uh, a voice. Uh, a lot of voices uh, that want uh, liquidation, that want day crypto now, give me 10%, 20%, whatever. Because I realize that a lot of people are in a position where is their life saving or they cannot pay rent uh, because of the Skaminski and the and and his uh, gang of thugs. But there are also people like myself which uh, would prefer to turn this loss into an investment. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, encourage uh, Simon and and the rest of you to fight also for a really transparent uh, community-led reorg uh, new co-plan 
that will create uh, something of uh, uh, substantial value for all of us that went into this with uh, the best of intentions, got caught in the storm, and now we kind of see perhaps there uh, with Simon uh, and and uh, the things happening that there might be something really great here that we can create uh, this new company uh that can you know bring us prosperity in 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 years and 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 days to come so yeah just that not really a question but just i i felt that this also needed to be said okay yeah thank so you i think that was a pitch for the tony toggle uh the tony toggle is where you can swipe left swipe right um in order to try and get more equity less coins um in order for that to work there's i think a prerequisite which is that there's a plan that has a compelling vision and a compelling future. So Nova Wolf, bring your best plan to the table and Tony Toggle will toggle right. Um, bring a shit tan to the table and everyone will be toggling left. Um, so, you know, that, that's, a, that's a really important feature that we'd like to see. Um, and uh, that requires putting together the best plan possible because there are a bunch of people that it's not their life saving. They would be okay to do a risk play. And there's a bunch of people where they just simply need their coin back. Um, and there is also, I know, people within Celsius in positions that believe that a controlled liquidation might be the right way to go about this. Now, I know that people don't like the controlled liquidation because it significantly increases the likelihood of um, clawbacks happening. Um, but I think it's an eventuality that we need to be prepared for, given what we're seeing in the Voyager um, and Binance and DOJ and SEC case. So we might as well be prepared for that. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, I hope we can uh, get this through the finish line. Yeah, I hope Simon, so as well. Thank you. Simon, one point he brings up that's, that could be very valid. In eliminating White and Case's ability to control the clawbacks, wouldn't that be better off just to give it to a company in America that does that type of business? Wouldn't it cost the creditors a lot less money? Uh, I So it seems like we've lost Simon. Simon, can you hear us? Oh, sorry, I was actually speaking. I gave like my best, my best content ever, and it was on mute. Um, it was on yeah. mute. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know when I stopped, but um, I, I do believe that there is a conflict between the law firm representing the UCC being the law firm that win wins the litigation trust business, um, and so I think that conflict needs to be addressed because. Uh, if you end up negotiating the best deal for creditors that leads to Chapter 11 2.0 and several millions of additional profit for you, um, then I think that needs to be understood. And the way you deal with that is having two different firms. So I think it's a really valid point. Um, and it should be a competitive process from my perspective. Who just as, you know, who's going to actually run the litigation trust? That should be an open tender um, and the most competitive business should win that. It shouldn't be a given. I'm sorry, I lost you early on there, Simon. It's just like a collection agency, what, what they do. And it would save us a lot of money because the lawyers are obviously only out to line their pockets. Yeah, we do need to come after insiders though as well. And there's probably going to be more cases that don't get that don't get resolved you know it's not just insider clawbacks from my perspective um, but the best way if you want to if you want to be a part of that process um they will be the ucc will be um, looking for committee members that want to join the litigation trust um so if you want to have if this is a particular issue for you if clawbacks is a is a real thing for you you, you might want to apply to be on that committee Okay, next uh, is Michael Yodler. 
Hello, Simon. Can you hear me? I can hear you well. All right. Um, I apologize, apologize if you've already uh, discussed this. I didn't make it today. I just uh, was able to call in a second ago. But um, I know that we have a, a bid um, from Nova Wolf, um, and that one was, I guess, considered the best bid. Um, and, and you and some others put in other bids that, uh, I guess, didn't win for whatever reason. Is this something now with the, the stocking horse that you may consider putting in another bid? Or I don't know if you can – even discuss that because I would definitely support a bit if you put that through. Um, I've signed an I've signed an agreement um, to work as a plan consultant. Um, it's unpaid, so I'm the only one that doesn't get paid from this process, um, as usual. So, um, <laughs> but uh, but you know, as part of that, I'd like to remain neutral and not try and push things over to uh, the business that I have an interest in. Um, I believe that there will be other businesses like uh, maybe. Abra and other companies where I will disclose if I have a shareholding. Um, but I think the best result is achieved by me remaining um, as neutral as I possibly can uh, and bringing as many people to the equation as I can. And, uh, you know, my structure was used for the Nova Wolf plan. They took out seven elements that I don't like. Um, but if uh, other companies want to compete and use the same structure in the stalking horse, and put together something that they do like. It's a massive, massive task, you know, and at the same time, I'll remain completely, you know, playful out in order to try and get the best deal with Nova Wolf for, for um, you know, where, where we are at this stage and also consider what the best type of controlled liquidation is. So I don't think putting bank to the future in the equation is the right strategy. We've seen the types of politics that can happen when you have a business that's not US first, and I would hate for our business to cause any of those types of issues for creditors uh, when we could put some U.S. first business. You know, uh, the tax, the tax man and the politics are all favored uh, when in Chapter 11 towards uh, everything staying within the U.S. OK, I understand. Thank you for your efforts. I, I really appreciate your supporting the community. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Day long. Hi, uh, just be real quick because I got I want to complete my uh, statement. Did uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah, you're clear now, loud and clear. Okay. Well, and again, I apologize. I'm only coming up twice because I got cut off. I apologize to everybody else. Um, I, again, I can't stress this enough. I, I I try to be objective as possible. I don't think anybody has true object, objectivity because they're always looking through their own prism. But I can totally see, and I'm sure Alan's going to come up and debate me, which is fine. He can say whatever he wants. I won't come back on. Um, is that if there was actual recovery to happen, I mean, I don't think people realize this is a two to 10 year process. And there are three defenses. I'm not an attorney. I do have a Juris Doctorate. And I, even if I didn't have a Juris Doctorate, they're plainly addressable to someone like me. And I'd imagine almost every single person who took out money just because the interest rate was low or they wanted to uh, diversify or any, there are three positive affirmative defenses that are going to get us to a, if we do settle to a dramatic the pennies on the dollar to quote an attorney um, that we all know uh, very well. I won't say his name, but he is this person has personally told me, yeah, you're looking at pennies on the dollar after they spend hundreds of millions of dollars of their own fees to line their own pockets. So I narratives are important. So I would encourage people on Twitter who are um, really running gunning to just take all the money back that it's not all going to come back. Um, a very small portion will come back, but it'll probably be equal to or less than the amount of money we spend and the opportunity cost too, which you really can't measure. The opportunity cost to go after retail clawbacks is massively, massively high. Thank you very much. I'm done for the day and I appreciate everything you do, Simon and, and uh, Mary and Aslam. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Daylong. Please take me down so somebody else can please. <laughs> Thanks, Daylong. Daylong. G-Man? Daylong, I put, oh, go ahead. I put something oh. on the nest here. Uh, you might want to consult with him. Uh, his name is Roland Jones. He's been a clawbacks uh, attorney for like 20 years. All he does is defend against clawbacks. So anyone that has significant clawbacks exposure, uh, it's probably worth your time to just give him, a, give him a call, 15 minutes or whatever. Maybe you could discuss it, see what your you, options you are. Think he's, work he's working with Dev Kofsky? Who's kind of taking the reins on that issue? Where they work together? No, but you don't want to rely on only one attorney. 
I, I, I'll give him a call. Very nice to you, Tony. I really appreciate it, sir. Thank yeah, you, I've been, sir. I've been talking to him recently, the last few weeks. Um, he seems pretty confident. Defenses are strong. But, again, it's it's called practicing law because there's no, like, you know, 100% answer. So you don't want to just rely on one attorney. Talk to two, talk to three, talk to four. You know, you have nothing to lose by it. Yeah, the one thing I've learned from this case is anything can happen. Um, and that's what's causing so much anxiety for people because – the unthinkable does happen, so we need to prepare for that, but we also need to push for what we want. That's the, the uncertainty is by far and away the hardest part of this whole process. It really is truly, and it's been going on for nine months, and God knows how much longer it's going to go on. Yeah, to deliver the bad news to, for you, um, I do believe that the Series B thing is not that they... I mean, there's 3.5 million billion of potential assets as defences, but... The biggest issue, and they're probably listening to it, so I don't think I'm telling them anything they don't know, but they can they can take their time, and we want to get this shit done. Um, and so they know that that's probably the pain point, um, because that will have to be settled until this progresses. I don't think they want to take over a mining operation. Um, and uh, if you're going to force us to drop some ASICs on your door and say, plug them in um, to the Canadian pension fund, um, then maybe that's where where this ends up going. Uh, but we need some real answers from the UCC around what what is what is what it is that is likely what the exposure is and what the strategy is. We may not get those answers because um, maybe it's not in our best interest to know where the strategy goes. But uh, you know that that is the the main outcome is a shakedown and a, and a delay. Um, it doesn't mean the plan is off because I think everyone's going to want to know what what the outcome of that is and and those are the final few things uh we've got custody settlement we've i think withhold settlement is coming we've got borrower negotiations um then we just got series b we got the final bits of litigation with uh, jason stone and uh various other things there's a business model there's a stalking horse um and now we need to get through the competitive process so do be prepared for the rest of the year um I, as painful as that sounds we still got to get through it. Yeah, also, not Absolutely. not trying to cast aspersions on Deb, but she also told everyone not to file a claim form. And, um, you know, that doesn't seem to have been good advice, <laughs> especially now with this whole Series B uh, preferred shares um, issue. Um, I'm not really sure how that's going to work out. But, again, like different attorneys have different experiences, different things that they focus on, different things that they're good at. Doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily mean they're 100 percent correct or 100 percent wrong, but you know different people have you know different opinions on things. It's good to just listen. Absolutely, it's true, Tony. Tony. That's true. Yeah. yeah. What freaking hope have we got if the lawyers can't even get this right? Jesus, man. No, I'm not. I'm not. You know, there's as you said, there are ones that have different experience and and they're already putting their head up above the line and and giving us. But Jesus, man, mm. I still don't know the answer to that. I'm thinking in the future we should change it to Fahrenheit. I feel like that'll bring in more Western folks. When I made Hope.com initially, I thought, you know, there's a few themes here we could go with, but I really think sticking to the cultural norms is what uh, breeds success. Thanks, Raybon. Uh, G-Man? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having uh, giving me some time. So, Simon, I think from my perspective, the biggest issue with the current plan is just the associated risk, especially with the forced um, investment into this new company um, with high risk. You know, I think most people on the platform um, does not have that appetite. We weren't there um, for like high risk. We were there for just maybe earning some interest. Um, you know, safety was always um you know, uh, from from uh, Mashinsky's mouth, it was so safe, etc. So um, I was thinking, since there's not enough of the pie to go around, um, let's say for argument's sake, just to simplify the thought experiment, and, and you obviously come from a financial background, if we could sort of structure this thing as a um, sort of a retirement annuity type of a financial model, you know, like, so there's a big pool of assets, um, if it could generate some income, even if it's, uh, let's say, for argument's sake, I know the Bitcoin Max is 
might not like this, but let's say we convert everything to ETH and it generates a 5% um, interest per year. Okay, so the new company or, or the fund that manages uh, this uh, asset, uh, you know, sort of entitled or everybody that, that's part of it is entitled to, to your, your claim. Um, so let's say it generates 5% and you get a, a cut or a dividend. Um, sort of in perpetuity or what's the word. So um, now I know some people don't have time on there. And so let's say you bring in that slider again, um, you know, somebody that wants out can reduce their claim by another 50%. So let's say in theory, you can get up to um, 50 or 70% uh, in 10 years, but some people want to get out. So they, they will say, okay, please sell my, my stake and I'll get, you know, 25% out immediately. Um, and other people, might say, listen, I, I do have time, but I don't want the risk. Uh, if you know, if the assets under management is controlled or sort of set up in a in a relatively safe way, um, but it's not a high risk, high reward type of scenario, you know, I think some people might think, okay, they'll they'll take that bet, um, and they they might, you know, sort of tie themselves to this fund um, for for years as long as it, it's sort of a reasonable, um, you know, uh, give and take. And, um, you know, in time, it, you know, like give 10 years, if you pay out 5% interest every year, um, or you just live off that, right? And then the, the management, you know, they maybe take 1% of it. So they don't necessarily get that much, but at least it's sort of a safe setup for, for trying to make people whole in, in the next decade or something like that. I don't know if you have thoughts around that sort of a, a retirement annuity type model instead of, forcing people to invest in a company that might fail in three years. Um, you know, mining is very competitive from, from what I've heard. And um, yeah, that's just sort of my, my thinking around it, if you can comment on that. Yeah, sure. So um, the way that this has been structured in the stalking course is that the, 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 lo the loans will be renegotiated and the, the, stake, the stake ETH is going to be used as a collateral. Um, I understand the business model and it's pretty smart, uh, but the the cost of that is that we end up having to give all of our stake DEs stake to Nuke, um, which by definition drives it to more of a less upfront. Um, and I don't yet know what the terms of what those stakes and how those stakes will actually be used in the, in the financial modeling. Um, so that's all in the, you know, the first version is in the term sheet. But I do believe that culturally this should be personally from my take on just listening to people, that people, are, people were here for the income, for the yield every Monday. And so I think people would prefer in general as much income up front, as much of a recovery up front. Um, and they'd probably give up less of the growth is just the general consensus. And so I believe that loans being renegotiated is an income play. Uh, the litigation trust is a one-time dividend play when they succeed. Um, the staking play, I think, is an illegitimate um, mechanism for charging a performance fee. And as much of that should be returned to creditors. And so if there's an alternative business model, I'd like to see that. If um, any other crypto lending companies have different models of how the fund gets paid and generates income based upon a business model that doesn't require taking the stake teeth, I you know I've seen interesting proposals that I think we should we should consider. Um, and you know, mining is 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 really the you know we, when we did mining in the past, you make as you make most of your mining returns in the sooner you can get your machines plugged in. So it absolutely kills me that we are in the current scenario that we're in where the difficulty rate is high. We've got distress in the market. We don't have clear access to financials to assess it as a standalone. It, it needs a restructuring. I think a lot of that restructuring work has been done. Um, but if all the stars and the moons line up and we can get that to profitability or the last court hearing based upon the Bitcoin price prior to the, the second wave crash um, was that it is profitable. I know that we've got community members that 
question those financials and those we we find i'm hoping that this now allows us to see proper financial modeling from nova wharf the different terms and making sure that those terms are put through a competitive process as well so yeah i think income is is the game here Uh, i think get as much money to people as soon as possible uh, through the new co and through uh, higher liquidity and then the, the old Tony Toggle to uh, make sure that we can try and match up some of the risk profiles. But it only works if there's a good plan because I've got capital to invest, but I, I'm, not, I'm not making another stupid investment. Um, so it's got to be a good plan. And that's, what, that's the challenge here. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah. So just to, to iterate again, if you know other companies are listening, if, if they can put it together something just maybe not as as um you know it's con- not going to shoot the the lights out or anything but uh, but it's a safe a safer bet i think people might might go for that but i think that's why people are just screaming liquidation because they just not they don't have the appetite to go another round at a new, you know a new a new celsius and and taking a risk again you know we've got burnt um so yeah I, I, yeah that's my my thoughts but thanks again yeah, and you I know, do want to say a controlled thing. liquidation is something that needs to be compared uh, because yeah. if it leads to people getting a lot more upfront and taking less risk, then we, we need to make that analysis. It does increase the chances of clawbacks, um, but maybe there's an innovative reorg liquidation that involves you know the lowest risk cryptocurrency, which would be Bitcoin, um, and getting people the ability to use some of the income generating that they can get up front and do with it as they choose. And there's all the crypto in kind. There's lots of there's lots of things which I really look forward to seeing what they're thinking um, and, and trying to make add some more transparency so they're not suddenly surprised in the plan. Mm. I cool. feel that Thank way you. Simon when it comes to business software. In the beginning for me it was tough. You know, being a CEO this long, it has its merits, but I can relate it to my struggle as a CEO as well. Okay. Um, thank you so much, G-Man. Next, we have Alan and then Raybon. Hey, hey guys. Hey, Simon. Uh, so I had three points slash questions. Uh, I'm going to just do it quickly. Uh, so first of all... Yeah, do um, one at a time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know how you operate. I know your modus operandi, as I say. Uh, what if ETH is... I'm slow. Uh, I can only handle one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all good. Uh, what if ETH is considered a security? Uh, down the road, so Noble Wolf... Uh, plan is approved, and then the SEC regulations uh, decide that, uh, that ETH is a security, how would that, what would happen in that, if, if that were to come to pass? Uh, I think we should make that assumption. And in, in, my, in the plan that I put forward, we assumed that ETH was a security. Um, and so we structured it into a security with public reporting standards. And Nova Wharf has the relevant licenses to do that. Um, personally, I don't believe ETH will be classified as a security, but I think ETH staking as a service would definitely be um, considered a security. And so, you, yeah, you can bet your bottom dollar that we'll be um, on, on top of that. But that's the advantage of the security token structure and structuring everything is is kind of the only reason that Bank to the Future survived all these years is because we, we started as a security and put crypto and, and Bitcoin innovation on top. And that allowed us to survive every cycle, every regulatory cycle. So um, do you see the way that Nova Wolf is structuring the, the new co uh, would accommodate for that and we wouldn't get, yes. you know, blind. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think um, we, we need to ensure that that's protected. Um, and Nova Wolf has the, the ATS partners. Um, if anyone listened to my controversy this week, it was because I was trying to explain that there's more than one ATS. Uh, and I've published, and the reason I know that is because I've been involved with them all from the beginning. And uh, for some reason, that turned into a little argument about who the uh, the CEO is, even though that wasn't really the question. Anyway, yeah, I, I listened to that. He was trying to do a got you, is what we'd call it. You know, he was trying to do a got like you don't know the name of this obscure. You know, then 
everything else you say must be wrong because you didn't know this one obscure detail. Uh, it was pretty clear what he was trying to do, and it, it wasn't. It didn't work on most people that understood. But uh, the second point uh, is we had a great conversation with Sean Owens yesterday. Joe Lehrer was doing a good good job uh, asking him some hard questions, and uh, he said that uh, Salt Lending is is trying to get the funding for a proposal. He has like thirty million raised. He's trying to get a hundred million. Do you know anything about that? Uh, could you speak to that? Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah. So. Um... Uh, Salt did what I tried to get Celsius to do, um, which was uh, open up your financials, come clean with your customers like Bitfinex did, and then implement a, a, a debt to equity restructuring and avoid Chapter 11. That was the original plan that we gave them. And you have two weeks to execute. I, I shared that with Bitfinex. I shared that with Celsius. I shared that with Salt. Salt did it. Celsius didn't do it. And we are where we are. Um, so they've implemented, and I can't vouch for it because, you know, these, these are, there's risk in the system. Um, but from what, if, you know, from what we are told, and I haven't done due diligence on this, uh, they've implemented a debt to equity swap and they're looking to raise finance in order to bring something to the table for um, the lending side. I don't have a shareholding in. Salt, you know the history. We tried to acquire them in order to put together a U.S. first bid. Um, that deal failed. Um, it looks like they're saying that they've overcome some of their distress. They've avoided Chapter 11, and they have m many hurdles to overcome, but uh, they're looking to engage in this process, and they see it as a, as a great opportunity. Um, so I hope, I hope that something comes forward uh, because they are already a public reporting company. Um, they do have some uh, issues with some of the state licenses that may become a thing. Um, but from all of our experience, I hope that we get to, you know, avoid as many of the things that we that we that we've been forecasting would come over the next eight months. And so let's let's see. Yeah, he, he was going over how he he uh, essentially converted all the debt to equity. So there was no payout, but it's a convertible uh, equity uh slip so like you can i i can't remember the exact method that but essentially you can convert the equity back into kind uh into crypto and kind and you could get some type of redemption like that it, it's um, a good model and it was the original model that we did with bitfinex a bit more slightly different and yeah. the model that we would have liked celsius to do but they weren't willing to disclose um and uh something that i think should be considered in the nova wolf structure so that at least there is some a debt element um, in in it, rather than just pure equity play. Just given the risk profile of some of the, the creditors. Well, frankly, I was hoping that you two could uh, can collab. So, you know, because you have you have a lot of rich uh, people that you know, and he's looking for funding. So I was thinking, you know, that's kind of your area of expertise. But uh, the last thing I was going to bring up is definitely the most controversial. Day long, don't skewer me. I'm just I'm just expressing my opinion, like you expressed yours. I think preferences are completely reasonable. I think that the fact that Celsius knew they were insolvent yet continued to honor withdrawals is, is stealing from every, everybody and anybody that wasn't able or didn't know to take their money out. And uh, unless you were taking normal withdrawals every single week, I, I think the argument, and of course it's up to, to the Honorable Judge Glenn to decide this, but I think the argument of normal course of business, well, it's not like you're a coffee shop getting regular deliveries of coffee and that's your, this is like, it's all unique. It's all uh, a one-time thing. And I think preferences and clawbacks, they're two, two distinct things. Clawbacks could go back as far as, you know, the trustee wants to. Preferences uh, is a specific outline. 90 days before bankruptcy is declared, um, uh, any payments that the debtor, uh, that the debtor uh, paid to creditors is subject to preference uh, clawbacks because it's not fair for everyone that didn't, you know, that didn't withdraw. And day long, that's my position. I think... Even if we can get 20% better recovery for all customers, that's, that's a net win. And uh, it's not 100% loss for every – if you took out a million dollars, it's not like they're going to take the whole million back. They're going to take the proportion that everyone else is getting haircutted in. So we're, we're, we're kind of like socializing the losses. And that's my, that's my take. Um, I, honestly, I would love if it was declared a Ponzi. And it goes that way it would take care of the liquidated loans. It would take care of uh, all the sell people, everyone would get taken. Yes, it would take a long time, but quite frankly, I think it's taking a long time anyway. 
So if, if we're not going to declare this thing a Ponzi, the next best thing is for 90 days before they declared bankruptcy to, to claw back uh, and then offset it for anything that's still held in the account. So any, any uh, for sure rewards, but I'm saying even principal, we should, why should I have to hold the bag for everyone else that was able to withdraw 100% on June 11th? I don't think that's fair. Alan, you good? Yeah, that's that was my rant rant over. I was waiting Alan, for the, 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 okay, great. What what I what I'd what I'd like to do? Thank you for giving both perspectives. So we've had Dale on on one ex, one extreme side and Alan on the other extreme side. So rather than this spiraling into a clawback argument, let me tell you that clawbacks are happening um, because the judge said they're happening by law. Then there are defenses, and there are people that are going to be spearheading those defenses. Um, and depending on the outcome, then clawbacks will need to be defined clearly in the litigation trust plan, or they're just going to disappear. So personally, if we could just take a little lesson from Judge Glenn, which is he drops the bomb on us, he tells us why, and it's the law, then we deal with it. Uh, then he says, here's the defences. Uh, and then he says, you will get a, an opportunity to put those defences forward. And then once we've come to terms with that, it, it, it's, uh, you know, how, how are they defined and what does the plan look like? So that is what I think is going to happen. And there's no amount of opinion or anything else that's going to change it, I don't think. I agree with you 100%, Simon. And, and I also encourage everyone that thinks they have a defence to defend it, but I think it would be uh, it would be a breach of fiduciary duty to not pursue this as two billion dollars left the estate ninety days before within ninety days before the uh, the, the uh, declaration of bankruptcy. So that's just my opinion. And Simon, I appreciate everything that you do. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Alan. Go ahead, Raybon. Yeah, so I'm wondering. You know, I've been hearing quite a bit of frustration about this this uh, this whole debacle, and I guess my question is. Uh, where does the interest or the, the drive come from to, uh, I guess, invest with these companies from, from the past? You know, there's been this invention in Bitcoin. I think we all know, you know, you want to move time and space over a long period of time. Well, how are you going to do it? You know, if there's no, no middleman, no counterparty risk. Why take on all this risk? I guess is my question. Yeah, the answer is if we could all have our private keys back and get a full recovery, then I don't think any of us would want to be involved in any of this shit ever. I'm again. talking about in the first place <laughs> though. Like why why the initial drive to to get money for free from your money that's already mathematically scarce? I'm just I'm having trouble with the ring around here. Yeah, well we all have our different story. Many represented and just outright fraudulently scammed. Um others were um probably kicking themselves with their greed. Others wanted a way to take risk and borrow against their Bitcoin because for tax reasons, they thought it was an efficient way of not selling their, their crypto. And, and others, this was just a complete YOLO for them to receive you know, some, some token and borrow against it. And for others, like the executives, it was just an outright way of extracting as much value um, from creditors as possible and they're going to um, experience consequences for it. I, I think you, it's Tom. a very important... I appreciate your honesty around this. Uh, there is no second best, as Sun Tzu once said. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Raybon. Uh, next we have Henry, then Matt, then Daylong. Hi, guys. Hello. I'll be very quick. Uh, Simon, on that Series B issue, because um, one thing I think the other perspective of that is don't don't the um don't, don't the issue there is like because you just you know said a couple of times and i know it was just being funny that we can drop the rigs on their doorstep but don't don't they they can't really get anything from us unless they pay us the debt back right because there is a debt owned to you know ours now first like three billion or something and then they can get the mining company if i'm wrong in this uh, I think you're right, um, and, and my position on this is um, I, I'm definitely going to leave this one to the lawyers, and I'm not going to I'm, I'm going to step out of this one just due to conflicts, because uh, 
you know, we don't we don't have any say because we 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 implement we did the community funding round through Bank to the Future, um, and so whatever the Series B would get, um, I think they might be dragged along, and I'm you know not too sure because we don't you know we're not like um, a pension fund where we do active management. We have a low cost structure, um, and you would get I think you would get dragged along to the outcome of that, um, and at the same time I, I'm I'm a creditor. Uh, so yeah. I'm going yeah, to step I... out of that one. And I think it's just a deeply technical legal process. And what I will do is try and report back anything that I get permission to um, report back. But, you know, uh, the judge said that there are very, I think he said, here's the defenses. They may get nothing. They may get something. They have a duty to their um, their pension fund in order to try and do meet their fiduciary duties. There is an intercompany loan, which um, adds uh, something to the equation. Um, and we know the maximum exposure, we know the minimum exposure, and it's going to make a significant difference. And so they're going to try, I th- I believe that they're just going to want to settle and, and do a shakedown. I won't have any involvement in that outcome. That's, a, that's going to be Judge Glenn. Uh, that's going to be the litigation. And that has to be resolved before we get any type of plan, I believe. The reason I ju- I just said that really quickly because you know like like the one gentleman said that we're just frustrated and scared because we don't know the unknown. So I just want to give the other perspective not to be so scared about that decision because of that issue. I mean we can give them all the mining if they give us the three billion, which will make us whole anyway. And other perspective, yes, they they can fight us, but here's the problem: we already paying our lawyers. If, if the Mr. Uh, Fisherberg can stop, you know, clogging them uh, with the stupid things, but we're already paying them for, and they can, you know, fight them. Uh, we're already paying them. For them, is an added expense. So if they continue fighting this and there's a possibility they, they won't get nothing, they're going to be in a deeper hole. So that's why I want to kind of bring. Yes, they don't have all the power. They're, they're stuck in a, in a long shot and they're pushing that long shot. The Celsius... Um, said that they're fighting the, the the side of creditors. The UCC said they're fighting the, the side of creditors. Um, and so really the only person that I know of that only benefits from shares but doesn't benefit from all their, because um, they will be subordinated, is actually the director of the, the holding company, which is Alex. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Henry. Uh, Matt, and then Daylong. All right. Hi, Simon. Thanks for holding this. Uh, before I ask my, my question, just quickly on this last question, there's a there may be a total of $3 billion in, in intercompany loans, but uh, those are not, those don't all rest with the mining entity. So um, that's a much smaller piece of the, of the pie. Um, and just by way of background, I'm a litigator. I'm not a bankruptcy attorney. Uh, but when I read that preferred equity opinion, you know, it's, it's very obvious that the judge is teeing up non-contract related claims like fraudulent misrepresentation. You know, I understand you just mentioned you, you feel you've, you've kind of got to be careful here because you're both a creditor and, and you also have some some equity through Bank to the Future. Um, but so so this doesn't require your opinion, this question here. I'm just wondering through your connections on the UCC. Uh, if you know whether White and Case is readying those non-contract related complaints, so you know the fraudulent mer- misrepresentation, um, things that that don't deal with the the terms of service uh, for the parent company, Celsius Network Limited, and other affiliated entities, uh, or if, in your opinion, pursuit of those alternative avenues are going to be left to individuals. Uh, firstly, I'm really grateful that you came up because I think your perspective is much deeper than mine. Um, the, I have no insight in terms of what the UCC is doing. This was dropped on me, uh, the same time as everybody else yesterday. Um, and I just tried to work through a bit of the game theory, but, um, please do come up each week and tell us your opinions. The UCC will be listening, um, and the UCC are planning what they're going to be doing. And, and the good thing is that Kirkland and Ellis, White and Case, um, are on the same team, this one. So you've got a pretty, you've got a pretty big force there. Um, and then you've got Millbank, which is a, a, the immovable object, uh, whatever that phrase is, uh, meeting the unstoppable. Yeah, I butchered that. Um, yeah, so please just, um, I don't have anything to add that, that you've had. So just keep up, okay. keep coming up and tell, share your opinion, because we're seriously missing a bunch of community lawyers that 
that can give much better opinions than I could on that one. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Plus uh, Kirkland and the UCC have been basically on the same team this entire time. So not much of a difference here, Simon. Thank you, Matt. Go ahead, Daylong. Yeah, just, uh, again, not a debate. I like Alan. I disagree with him. Cam Cruz, I have disagreed with him. Both are great people. I enjoy talking to them. In fact, I'll even put it out here. One night I was very upset, and Cam actually spoke to me, and I really appreciated that. And, uh, it was really nice of him. So I just wanted, for the people that go after Cam, he's a really nice guy. Um, but uh, just to put some color on uh, what Alan said before, please keep in mind that the withdrawal amount in dollar terms is light years lower from a lot of people, particularly people who took money out in May or even before, slightly after that. So the clawback amount is a massive dollar amount relative to the Bitcoin price at the time. So please keep that in mind. Additionally, um, I think it's important to know that, like, for example, someone like me, and you won't know these names, Alan or Cam or anybody else, but Simon certainly will. I had about half on BSAVE and about half on Magner in 2016. Then I made the shift to half on BSAVE and Wow, Magna. Are they still around? What happened to Magna? I didn't know that. Thank God they closed down and nobody <laughs> got hurt because they did, They just did the right thing. Um, I wasn't. God, I remember Magna. Yeah, Magna. Yeah. So B Save and Magna the first. So I had was B Save, B Save and Magna, then B Save and Celsius, then Celsius and BlockFi. And then Abra comes out of nowhere and they start doing something very mature, in my opinion, is they have uh, term contracts where I've had money with them since I pulled it out of Celsius almost a year ago. Um, last May, uh, and believe me, I would have taken it out if I could have, but I'm under contract to not do it, and I've been extraordinarily pleased with everything they've done because obviously everybody freaks out. They take out their money. That would have been pulling my money out uh, in uh, in a because in I was shocked and scared, but I didn't do that with Celsius. So I just want you to see that there's, that applies. That's the, that's the net ordinary course of business defense right there, and I think what um, – Alan is very innocently missing, very innocently missing, is that, yeah, I agree with everything you said, Simon, but the the process of defending this, the time, and again, the time and the money and the opportunity cost to everybody is really, really significant. So, again, it's, there's nothing that I'm going to say or Simon's going to say or Alan's going to say or Cam is going to say that's going to really affect whether or not there are retail clawbacks. But just please note that there's not a magic honeypot that's going to show up in everybody's coffers um, the second. The defenses are pretty, pretty strong. So, again, keep that in mind um, while we go through this debate. And like Simon says, I am very willing, very willing to, uh, even if I disagree, to give a piece of what I've taken out or what I have still on the platform to get this thing rolling. Absolutely 110% particularly if it doesn't really affect, I'm already planning on, I have a leased house that I, that I'm been renting uh, for, it'll be over in December. I am going, I'm cutting everything in half. I've already cut everything in half again. So I'm going to go back to 20, about 25% from where I was at the height of the market. Uh, people are, who are subject to the clawbacks have felt pain. Um, and they are cutting back their living expenses. It's not like, uh, you know, we're not feeling the pain too, but um, of course we don't want to make it worse. But again, I totally understand. Hey, I, I got everything on there. If that's you, Alan. And I'd like, if I get a penny more, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I totally get that. But please understand. I think that's a very unlikely scenario in my opinion, from all the research I've done. And I just want to continue to thank this amazing community of people who have, when I've been scared um, and, and hurt that have come out, they've called me. Uh, again, the Cam, what a really nice guy. Just a lot of things he says, but really good person. And they're just let's let's try and work as a team as much as we can. That's all. I, that's all I wanted to say. And I know I, I made a promise not to come back on. And I broke it, but I just wanted to respond. And I'm sorry. And Simon, thank you again for everything you do. Hey, Daylon, would you, thanks. Would Daylon. you would you be on board with the idea I floated around as a uh, uh, pre clawback uh, settlement? Whoever withdrew can uh, elect to put 10% of whatever they withdrew the dollar amount back, and then they waive preferences. Because that's what I'm not getting. I, it sounds very good. It sounds like something I've already offered. It's pretty close, so I'm not going to comment on it because I am trying to put this baby to bed, for uh, lack of a better way of explaining it. But if something reasonable came out, uh, you know, again, do I believe I should put any money back or get hurt? No. 
But if it would move the process along faster for everybody, 110%. 110%. Because I know, again, I took money out. So I haven't been hurting as much as somebody who has everything on there. And I get that. And that fucking sucks. I believe me, I feel your pain halfway. Not all the way, but halfway. But if I could contribute a little bit to get us out of this absolute fucking shithole, this nightmare that has been agonizing. I put on weight. It's, it's like it's almost like a divorce in a lot of ways. If you've been divorced before, this is pretty much the same type of thing because your life has been inexplicably, well, has been changed at, and there's nothing you can do about it, which unfortunately I went through two years ago um, and I'm just tr- trying to protect, you know, my lifestyle with my kids. I, I don't want them to have anything fancy. I want them, you know, to have BMX bikes and, you know, be able to you know, go swimming at the club with me. And uh, I don't belong to a country club. You know, I belong to a nice gym with a nice pool. That's all I'm trying to do here. Um, I'm transitioning out of finance to get a very steady government job. I'm changing everything I'm doing because of this. And I'm more than happy to do that. Um, but just please understand, just because you took money out doesn't mean life is uh, awesome. It's better. I'm not debating that. But just, again, we got to work as a team. Again, Cam, I can't say enough good things about him. Um, he and I disagreed on a lot of stuff. But if somebody's upset and they're struggling with this thing, please have an open heart and open phone call. It does amazing things uh, to have a community behind you. And I just want to say thank you to everybody who's, uh, again, and I promise this is my last time. I promise. I'll step down. <laughs> Thank you, Long. You can come up as often as you want. You add um, a lot of value. So thank you so much. Keep coming up. Thank you, Mary. Um, um, next, we have Ken Masters, then Vartan, then Lawrence Porter. Yes, thank you, Mary. Uh, Simon, uh, thank you for hosting the space. Uh, I was just wondering, we are like uh, eight months in this process. And I was just wondering, um, how far are we? Are we like uh, past fifty percent of the process already, or not, or are you at like seventy percent? Or yeah, I think um, <laughs> the, the the stretch goal is to get our money in June. I think we've got the SEC to go through. I think we've got the DOJ to go through, and I think we've got Series B to go through. Um, so I don't want to. I think everyone should be preparing for the rest of this year. So uh, it will probably uh, go past uh, June, maybe July or August or something. Maybe then we get money back. I, I think it's a great goal to work towards, but this, this, those, uh, those are three massive hurdles that are not factored into that equation that I think are inevitable. And do you think that if um, the plan will be, uh, how do you say, executed correctly, do you think uh, creditors will have a... Uh, like a, a good uh, amount, of, a good uh, recovery. You still positive about that because of the lawyer fees, etc. Uh, I'm I'm not in my mind thinking that there's a full recovery. I think everyone should be preparing for a haircut, um, but I'd I'd love to see everyone get as much coins back as possible, um, and uh, you know, and and then dividends, quarterly dividends, and exit. Um, you know, fo- focus on income and getting as much money out as possible, as fast as possible, rather than all of the longer term growth. And if anyone disagrees with that, then then let me know. But yeah, uh, I think the only way you get a full recovery is if you do a growth pay and you take much higher risk. If you do an income pay, I don't think you'll get a full recovery, but I think you'll get your money sooner and you can figure out what to do with it to, to invest in the growth that you want to go, go into. Okay, so... Um... From the way you're saying it, is that we have already passed like fifty uh, percent of the process because we are in this eight months already. So, yeah, I think that's reasonable. Okay, well, uh, thanks. But, you know, I'm not exactly the best at estimating these things. <laughs> okay, well, uh, thanks for answering. I'll step down. Okay, who's next? Are you there, Mary, or you dropped off? Okay, I think we lost Mary, maybe. Uh, it's, it's either Vartan or uh, the one with the lemons. Okay, speak now. It's a free-for-all. Hi, Simon. Hello. Hi, Simon. Thank you for having me. No worries. 
Um, just want to say, I just want to kindly push back on Alan just a little bit because um, I think he his last comment was, why why should he be left holding the bag? And I'm sorry, I don't want this to be a clawback debate again, but um, just wanted to say like uh, the the problem with that argument is that the other side of that is that you're you you end up punishing people who are listening to warning signs and. Um, it's kind of like a burning building. Um, and if you, if you're the person that, that is li- is looking around you at the burning building and you're running out, you're going to end up punishing him and bring, bring him back into the burning building, which doesn't make sense. So I do think that what he said about the socializing of the losses, I, I don't think that's the right thing to do because it just, um, you, again, you're punishing people for listening to warning signs, but that's all I want to say. Thanks. Okay, who's next? Is it the one with the lemon? Yes, please. All right. Uh, first of all, just a, just a quick question, and this is a serious question. I'm not just here taking the pesh. Uh, what, can, what can persons who did not put in a claim uh, for unliquidated damages do to update that and improve our standing? Is there any hope of doing that in mass? Uh, maybe the lawyer could come back and um, maybe they've got a good answer. I don't think I could give you a reasonable answer as, as a non-lawyer. But um, I do know one thing, that um, if the process goes through a liquidation, everyone has to submit their forms again. So there is a reboot mechanism if it ends up going in that direction. Well, personally, I'm not the least bit frightened of liquidation. I just don't think I got any good advice from the UCC. In fact, I think I got bad advice from the UCC, and it's been to my detriment. Uh, That's probably another reason why the litigation trust might want to be run by another law firm, uh, because there may be um, claims that want to... There's probably a good reason why there may be a conflict between representing the UCC and representing the litigation trust. Yeah, Yolo, you got anything, any ideas on that? Um, well, I, I, no, there, is, there isn't a legal conflict really between the litigation trust and the UCC. The UCC will be out of business. Um, and so it's possible whether or not White and Case gets that job, who knows. Um, and, you know, I, I think that there's good arguments that let's say that White and Case may not. Uh, and to the person who said they got bad advice from the UCC law firm from White and Case, uh, a reminder, uh, you're not White and Case's client. The UCC is White and Case's client, so the you know the the White and Case uh, has no obligation to represent you, uh, and um, K and E certainly uh, you know isn't representing you. They're they're representing uh, Celsius. Terrific. So Yolo, is there anything I can do to improve my position? Back to the original question. So so, so if I think I heard your your question was you submitted a claim form, you had I some did not. claims. Up- I did not. Oh, That's you did not point. submit a claim form. No, the, the, the answer were correct, so I didn't need to do anything. So, so, so the answer is no. Okay, Colonel, did you are you did you get your question answered? Okay, well, he went away. Uh, sorry about that. Um, is so, Terry so, James still up here? Yes, yeah, so, so I'm just saying because he didn't he, if he didn't file a claim form by the bar date, you can't now file a claim form and claim claims. That's why the answer was a simple no. Yeah, I mean, I largely agree with that. The one, this is Manny. I mean, the one thing I'll say is like, if you want to file a late one, it's like the sooner the better and you'd have to file a motion. And if you want it to have it accepted and if you want to try that as pro se and say the preferred decision made you file it or something like that, you can try and see what Judge Glenn does, but it's going to be... I mean, people may have seen what happened to Celsius when they filed a late claim in Voyager. They filed it months late. It's like the longer you wait, the less likely it's going to be accepted. But it's still like a big uphill battle to get a late claim accepted. But if you filed a claim, it's easier to amend it. That's sort of, and Kirkland has some articles on that out there. But it's it's pretty hard to, if you didn't file a claim, to get a late claim accepted. Yeah, when, when I spoke to counsel, they said the bankruptcy is very, very, very reluctant to do anything like that right and if you're going to do it you're not going to succeed as a pro se sorry manny 
you know, you need to hire a lawyer to actually do it. To, to file a late one, yeah, I mean, you'd probably, yeah, you'd, you'd probably have a better chance. Um, but, like, if, if you want to amend it, that's, like, a lot easier. Like, but, yeah, it's much harder if you didn't file one. Um, there's sort of a presumption if you filed one that you might amend it. And plus, you are the majority. So I think there was only 23,000 forms of 600 people, 600,000 people. Um, Robert Bale, I believe you're next. Robert Bailey. Okay, I'm going to move on to Lawrence. Yeah, <clears throat> Simon, forgive me if I'm repeating something that you've already discussed. Wasn't it entered into court documents that the um, mining operation was owned by the creditors and not by the Series B? Or was it in the examiner's report? And if it was in court and it was admitted as evidence and the mining operation is, is, is going to go to the B round, then what is Nova Wolf really doing for business if that's not part of the business that they're taking over and that goes back to the other comment i made to you today wouldn't we be better off with a collection agency as opposed to any law firm white in case or others thank you yeah, my, my opinion and complete uh, amateur legal opinion um is i don't think there would be a nova wolf if there is no mining operation um, I think that's a, a vital part of what they want to do in this plan. Um, and I don't think the Series B want the mining operation. I think they want a settlement. So th those are my just um, amateur understanding. Okay, so um, I, I don't believe that there was... I, I can't recall a ruling as to where mining landed. I did review document 2092, which described the intercompany loans and also has a corporate structure. That showed that mining is a sub of LLC, the U.S. entity, not LTD, and that um, LLC is a sub of LTD, essentially. So mining is owned by the LLC entity, uh, and the intercompany debt uh, you know, of that, whatever it is, 700 million between uh, uh, mining and LLC is owed by mining to LLC. And then, um, as I think the most important thing in Glenn's decision yesterday was not the actual decision, which was certainly a setback for creditors, but was footnote one on page three, which pointed out that there were two other ways other than that decision that creditors would still prevail over the preferred, one being this $3.5 billion approximately intercompany debt between LTD and LLC, and the second being uh, uh, the possibility of arguing substantive consolidation among all the entities. So I, I know everybody's upset about yesterday's decision, and certainly it wasn't a good thing for us, but it's far from the end of the world, and it doesn't mean that the preferred have this, you know, all of a sudden they got ownership of, uh, of the mining, because that's not true. There is a, a piece that's, I think, more closer to what the preferred get, which is they have a stronger argument to upstream the proceeds from the sale of GK8, the $40 million and change, that that would go into LTD, which, you know, if that ruling holds, that would benefit them. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, Ethereum. Yeah, hi everybody. Good afternoon. I'm I'm a little bit confused now because the memorandum from the judge basically is saying mining is not something that the creditors have leverage into, and the only thing we have leverage into is the LLC. But now, obviously, the previous gentleman said the LLC owns the mining, which is then confusing. So. If, so, the, so, so that you're, you're the, the, I mean, I'll go back, but I thought the opinion said that they, that the preferred basically did have claims on the LTD limited, i.e., which is the UK entity. It, it didn't address specifically the ownership of mining, unless I misread it. Yeah, I, don't, I, I didn't get that from the memorandum that I read. 
maybe I can be, if I'm wrong, I'm happily corrected by someone more, more uh, influential here. But the, the other point is, if the mining is not something that creditors have, have uh, entitlements to or leverage to, then if Noah Wolf or whoever is the winning bidder in the end, what are they going to do? What, what is our outcome as a creditor? Because as an individual with almost six figures locked up here, I really don't know what the outcome is. I thought we were going one path and there is a possibility for a haircut, possibility for um, conversion into MST, EST. And now with that memorandum that came out, it seems to just throw a massive wrench in the works that says maybe the Norwolf bid is now going to significantly change because maybe they are only interested in the mining, which is probably the most profitable part of Celsius. So what happens to us as creditors? Because if the LLC is not inclusive of the mining, then the balance on the Celsius books in the LLC will be significantly less, which means our haircut, if it goes that path, will be significantly more. So we will get even less back. So that's the first question. I'm, I'm, I'd, like to be, I'd like to be set straight, to be honest, because I'm totally confused now. And the other part is... If investors or creditors have their crypto accounts documented in inheritance trusts, clawbacks won't work. You can't claw back against an inheritance trust. That's the whole point of an inheritance trust. So how would that work? Not that I, cl- not that I took any money out anyway. I was way, way too late to the game. All of, my, all of my money stuck in Celsius. So I'm, I'm a bit confused. If someone can try and answer some of that, I'd appreciate it. So, so uh, honestly, I think that Nova Wolf is not primarily interested in the mining. I think that that's all this big assumption because, you know, these Terra Wolf guys are around. But the the juice in the whole Nova Wolf deal for them is the sponsor agreement where they're getting paid this 1.9% annual management fee and the 10%, you know, performance fee. That's that's what they're buying, right? So, as part of the Nara Wolf bid, if that goes ahead and that's still the, the the end path, we all get converted. All of our coins get converted into MST EST, which is a taxable event, right? Some, and then some, some, we, ha- we have to pay ta- we pay tax against that, right? And then, depending on EST and MST growth. That if they don't match, for instance, Bitcoin growth or Ethereum growth, for instance, as the coins we have, we lose out again. Right? Is that is that okay, correct so, understanding? So so partial. Some of your coins get converted into EST and MST. The rest of your coins get converted into this basket of of you know liquid cur- cryptocurrency being uh, Bitcoin ETH and stable coin. Okay. Majority of that's distributed off the platform. They've said that they're going to keep a hundred million or so of the liquid crypto to capitalize the new co. And then of course you have to pay out everybody else. i.e., convenience class, uh, mm. the custody settlement, um, et, et cetera. Um, and so that reduces what the general earn, i.e. the over 5,000 earn creditors get in terms of liquid crypto as a payout. Yeah. Okay. All right, that makes sense. So my last my last point, if you can give me just another minute, is in a, in in alignment with the one of the previous callers was didn't put in a documented claim because their coins were correct when they were released as a as the statement to the court. I'm in the same situation, didn't put in an individual claim because the coin number's correct. So what position does that leave me in? Is that a good position or is that a bad position? I really don't know. It's, that's the position of 90% of creditors. And, um, you know, it, it gives you, you know, a claim to your coins, assuming that they were all correct. The only thing that's most likely going to happen with people like me who happen to spend some time and write out additional claims is, A, either will settle, right? Because if you're in one of the settlement classes, you have to give up those claims. Or B, those claims will be contributed to the litigation trust, which will be pursued by the litigation trustee. 
I think it's highly unlikely that any creditor is going to pursue um, their claims on an individual basis. It's just too mm -hmm. prohibitive. Uh, and, you know, potentially maybe there are some class actions that get formed that those claims get right. contributed to. Okay. So just basically sit tight and let it lay out. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks very much Patience. for your time. Appreciate it. I hand, yeah, I'll hand back. Thanks, everybody, for your time. Thanks, Ethereum. Um, next hey, Mary, just to, just to give some market news in the midst of Celsius news, um, uh, USDC... Uh, has exposure to Silicon Valley Bank. Silicon Valley Bank has just gone bust. Uh, USDC has currently got 43 billion of market cap. They wow. held 9 billion, 9.8 billion of cash, and a percentage of it uh, was held with Silicon Valley Bank. And so there may be an amount above the the uh, FDIC insurance that would make it un, potentially unbacked. Um, and full disclosure, I'm a shareholder in Circle and Coinbase, who created the USDC stablecoin. Um, it hasn't de-pegged yet. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's no, not seen anything yet, but that's not good news. What do you make of yeah. these, ban these banks? These uh, banks, what's happening here? What's causing this? Uh, yeah, so it's an issue. Um, you know, the I don't think it's a 2008 event, but um, there is, uh, yeah, this is something definitely to watch. Um, I think they're, they're significantly more capitalized than than 2008 scenario. Simon, I'm sorry to jump in. There is another hosting call all about SVIB and a potential bank collapse 2.0 at the same time as this call. It's ongoing on another channel. Yeah, it's Mario, okay. it's Mario Space. Greg Foss is in there. Scott, Scott Walker, Melker. Yeah, that's correct. It's Mario's. Wow. Hey, Simon, how much longer did you want to... Go on the space. Oh, we do have some people on the stage. Um, let's do let's do a few more. I think. Um, yeah, I don't think we need to make this a long one. Okay. So then um, I have Aon, and then Joe, and then Crypto Crank. Yeah, oh, let's I'm end sorry. it there. I'm so sorry. I skipped over Stephen Ivan. He's been waiting for a while. Can you take four? Yeah, let's do four, and then we'll end. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mary. I'll make. You want me to go now? I just have a quick question. Go ahead, Aaron. Okay, uh, Simon, uh, thank you again. Uh, congratulations on your new appointment as the Minister of Transparency. Um, would there be a way to collect, like you suggested in your video, like people could write in with uh, any suggestions or ideas to be shared with the other bodies involved with the plan? Would there be a, a simplified way to communicate uh, with any ideas or is it only going to be here, for example, on your weekly spaces? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, you can do that with the UCC right now. Um, I'm not taking on UCC customer service by any stretch. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do it well. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to be involved in certain key meetings um, and uh, I, I will be reporting back what I'm allowed to report back. Um, and uh, anyone that wants to speak up on any of the matters um, should speak up, and there'll be the right people listening. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, go ahead, Joe. Uh, actually, I think it was me, Mary. Um, oh, sorry, Aeon. Sorry, Aeon. <laughs> no, it's okay. Thanks, Mary. Uh, Simon, thank you. I, I just a question and then a quick point. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you. I'm probably going to end up swapping my USDC over to USDT. Um, first question is going to be regarding the, the Bitcoin. I want to congratulate you to getting your Bitcoin credited back to your account. Did you file a claim for that? Or, or because I know that you didn't file the claim, uh, you know, before the date, how did you do, uh, you know, get that done? If you don't mind me asking. Yeah, I, I'm the only one in that case. So I know people tried to try to combine their litigated, lo um, liquidated loans and various other unique situations to it. Um, but they, they did an analysis, they looked at my account, and after completing an investigation, they were very keen to settle. Um, so they said that they'll put the 298 Bitcoin, um, you know, it was it was more egregious than anyone else's account. Uh, so they put the 298 Bitcoin back in and, and wrote it. Um, and they, yeah, they have a process. Uh, I think they'll be filing a motion to update certain claims as a result of that, which they have the authority to do at Celsius.
All right, very nice. Well, congrats. Well deserved, if you ask me. Um, the, the last part is just you know more of a point, uh, and I think it needs to be addressed a little bit more because it's essentially when it comes to these clawbacks, are people going to be getting clawed back dollar amounts or in kind? And I I, I was in a space with Crypto BTC and he was reading out one of the dockets and he was saying that the thing that's being clawed back is whatever is higher in value. So I, it seems kind of I don't know. It's good for the people that are in the boat. It's bad for the people that are out of the boat. So I'm just kind of curious on what you think about that. And, and you know, obviously needs to be brought yeah, up. My, my Twitter, uh, my Twitter non-lawyer um, op- legal opinion um, that you shouldn't take as legal advice. I think everything's going to be dollars. I don't. I, I, yeah, yeah, I well, don't think... the, the answer is that it depends. So if you take one of the settlements i.e. the 27.5%, for example, between 100 and 250, that specifies that it's going to be dollars um, at, you know, valued at the time of withdrawal of, the, of your crypto, right? So if, if you, know, you took out a Bitcoin, it was $20,000, or you took out six Bitcoin and they were $20,000 when you took them out, you'd owe uh, $120,000 if you take that settlement. If you, take, if you don't take the settlement, and you negotiate your own settlement or you fight the clawback, you have the right to repay it in kind or in terms of dollars at that time. Cool. Thank you. Is that confirmed? Is it, was that in the term sheet? The, the term sheet only discusses the settlement. If you, I'm telling you the law and clawbacks is you have the right to return it in kind. Okay, that's the, the law side, yeah? Cool. Well, I thought they had the Is right it... to ask for it in kind or in dollars versus us having the right to specify how we pay. There was something that yeah, yeah. there was something that we were reading. Crypto BTC was going through one of the dockets and it specified whatever is higher value needs to be paid back. I would have to go look for that. Because I think that, that, that's under the but those are all under the terms of the settlements that are offered within the plan to the potential clawbacks. Right, right. So, so you have to understand that what's what's in the plan is a definition of, you know, kind of who's not going to be clawed back if you if you vote for the plan and things like that. And um, you know, if you want to settle your clawback claim and, you know, accept the settlement that's offered, that's that's what's in there. What's not in the plan is what happens once the plan becomes effective. And this litigation trust and the clawback subcommittee goes into operation, and that's going to end this alter, alternative dis, dispute, you know, procedure, which will be disclosed, I think, in the disclosure statement. All that's going to be determined post effectiveness of the plan, uh, and you know, in the various proceedings that are going to take place later. Okay, um, crypto crank. Yeah, I just have a a quick uh, run through Um, for those that didn't file claims or whatever. Maybe someone can help me with this one. Didn't they enter one uh, on our behalf? And if they did that, then I don't understand why it couldn't be amended if needed. Well, I think they can amend it, but I don't think you can if you didn't put it on the, on your behalf well no i mean me personally i did but i'm thinking about others that may not have because of for various reasons we'll just say that well so all the claims get filed like simon said kirkland can go back and adjust it if it needs to be adjusted but if you didn't file then you can't adjust it like i filed so i can go back and change what i filed but if I didn't file, then I can't go back and change it. But Stretto files automatically for everybody so that you get a piece of the pie. Okay, I mean, I'm just trying to trying to make sure because if one thing was entered on your behalf there, then I guess I don't understand why it couldn't be amended if it was needed to be. But that's just me. I'll, I'll have to work through that. And I'm pretty sure others will have to work through that one. I appreciate the answer, Tony, man. Thanks, Crypto Crank. Um, 
the last person, and I apologize for those uh, that didn't get an opportunity as time was limited, um, is going to be Joe. Yeah, actually, uh, Crypto Crane kind of hit my question, but uh, maybe Crypto Yolo can add some uh, color to it and uh, hopefully allay people's fears. I think David Adler mentioned at some point that, you know, ultimately all these non-contract claims will probably end up getting assigned to the liquidation trust. And if that is done, uh, hopefully that would benefit everybody, whether they filed a claim or not. Crypto yeah, no, that, 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 that's right. I mean, as, as I said... You know, there's, I don't think anybody's going to pursue it themselves. And, and all the, you know, the vast majority, certainly if my claims aren't released through one of these settlements, I would most likely contribute it to the liquidation trust. And then whatever recoveries, and this, you know, this, you got to keep this in mind, whatever recoveries you get from that litigation trust, the litigation trust gets from like Mashinsky, the other insiders, the insurance policies, and from clawbacks. Those are all distributed to all the earned creditors who have a stake in the litigation trust. Great. Okay. And I just wanted to comment, um, Simon, thank you for doing everything you're doing to try to bring, uh, you know, the right players to the table and, and get a competitive deal uh, put forward. Um, this has been a very difficult process for everybody. And, uh, Nobody knew who to trust at, at different points, but, you know, you uh, have taken a beating and at this point you're still working for the community. It seems to, you know, bring uh, the right players together and, and make something happen. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Joe. It means a lot to me. Yeah. Thanks again, everyone. YOLO, thanks so much for helping out as always. And everyone for all your questions are very important. It helps others. Um, Simon, thank you so much for letting me help you run, run the room. I really appreciate that. Um, keep asking those questions, everyone. Um, and Simon, if you can, maybe some people might have missed your um, YouTube um, and you had an announcement in there and that you were going to be helping the UCC. So if you can just kind of um, let the room know and then um, you can sign off. But thanks, everyone. Yeah, sure. So um, I, yeah, uh, I've actually signed an agreement with Celsius in Kirkland. So um, to act as a, I think they call it a plan consultation um, and a consultant. It's unpaid, um, so I'm not taking anything out of the estate. Um, but my primary goal is that um, I will be able to sit in the negotiation meetings um, and uh, as a result, they'll tell me certain things I'm not that are confidential. They really uh, release from the NDA and what they want is a level of transparency and communication outside of UCC, outside of Celsius. Um, and it was really their kind of commitment that they want to get the best, you know, the, a lot of the, they want to get the best plan for creditors. Um, and they, it's like a, a signal that they, un, it's, it's, it's unconventional and they'd like to add a layer of transparency. So they've released me where I can free, freely give feedback freely talk about things, but where it would be harmful to the deal, they'll write to me and say, you shouldn't really mention this thing. Um, and so, yeah, the, I think it's a, it's a good sign to be able to just have an in-between between the UCC, Celsius, um, and, and someone that is purely a creditor. And as, as a result of that, I've taken Bank to the Future out of the equation. Um, and so at the same time, I'd like the, the stalking horse options to be pursued by as many uh, people. And in the YouTube video, I went through some of the things that if someone can seriously pull together a term sheet, um, then a desire for the UCC to put the extra mile in, uh, coordinate with a bunch of different players, because I don't think there's one player that can do everything like Nova Wolf. Uh, and so just to try and get uh, you know, more, more competitive tension as a result of the, the stalking horse. So we'll see whether that materializes. Um, so it's a commitment to three things, which is one, trying to make sure that Nova Wolf is the best deal possible and it's not a plan, a disclosure statement that jumps a bunch of surprises on you because there's a communication and iterative process. Uh, second, a, a commitment to try and bring other players that might be able to do better and uh, see if they can be coordinated via the UCC for some kind of plan there or work with Celsius. And thirdly, what an actual, you know, if it turns out that 
the Series B thing goes in the wrong direction or there's something that would lead to liquidation being a better option? What would a controlled liquidation look like where we get more of a crypto liquidation as opposed to a US trustee liquidation um, and, and how we could achieve that? So those are, those are the commitments. Um, and I do just want to leave before we go off. And um, please do check your USDC exposure. Um, I think we got Ronan up, so we should probably say a few things. Um, but please check your USDC exposure. If you've got funds on exchanges, don't end up in another Celsius. You shouldn't be in that position right now. Um, Self-custody, uh, if you can. And uh, yeah, if you've, if you've got to jump off and make some decisions, I don't want to create panic in the market right now, but Silicon Valley Bank has gone bust uh, and uh, USDC has exposure. They hold $9.8 billion dollars in cash in, in cash or exposure to the bank and a percentage of that um, is with Silicon Valley Bank. So there's a potential that it's not backed at this moment. It hasn't de-pegged, um, but just uh, make, make those decisions if you need to make those decisions. Uh, Ronan, did you want to have the closing words on a lighter note? Simon, I didn't know this space was ending. I saw USDC and I thought it was USDC and the C stands for sell as part of a one reserve currency. But uh, I didn't know we're catching the tail end of this. But, uh, hey, I, I just want to say I appreciate, Simon, everything that you're doing in terms of just as a creditor in this experience because not all of us are able to dial in day in and day out and appreciate everything that you're doing to keep uh, creditors informed. And you've, you've got everyone's best interest at heart and – appreciate everything you're doing and and truly i hope uh in the near future within the next two years everyone on this call that's been dialed in we all meet in l or excuse me cell salvador and we look back on this time uh with a almost bittersweet bittersweet bankruptcy in which we can all uh laugh and uh we're all nova wolves now so thanks simon i appreciate it Okay, cheers. Yeah, the hash token's going to be grown and we're going to get our CBD, CBD currency. All right, on that note, over and out, um, I'm going to check out what's going on with the, the banking crashes. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.